I think it's a wonderful program, the Lodha Genius program, uh, and the great ideas in science. That's the headline of this program. As I understand, uh, this is also the first time that the program is, has been launched at Ashoka. And Ashoka is very proud to host such a program. And we must thank the sponsors of this program uh, before I start, that it's a wonderful idea. And I, I'm sure uh, all of you are enjoying. Uh, you also know that there is a parallel program going on in the Young Scholars Program, which is also school high schoolers. So it's very interesting that Ashoka is now as full of high schoolers uh, who hopefully will get into Ashoka one day. And some of you very soon. Uh, I'm told by Dr. Anupama that chemistry is not a very popular subject in school. Uh, of course, she didn't have to tell me. I, 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 could, have, I could have guessed it uh, because I know the way the chemistry is taught in school. So that's the unfortunate part, and I must begin with the uh, bad, bad part. Bad part, good part, bad part. You come follow. So the bad part is that the chemistry is not taught well in the school, and that is the reason you are scared. Little realizing that chemistry is everywhere. Everywhere around you that you see is chemistry. What in the world is not chemistry? And I, I would provoke you to tell me a single thing which is not chemistry. In the, but even those are made of chemistry. So I think it's very hard to find objects which are not chemistry. But the point is, what is chemistry, first of all? Is chemistry different from the science? It's not. The biology that you learn is also chemistry. Because biological molecules are made of molecules. So wherever there is a molecule, there is a chemistry. That is the reason I have titled specific subject today as atoms to molecule to matter. How do you build matter? This is a matter. This is a matter. I hope you understand. The table is a matter, right? But this table is built out of molecules. Molecules are built out of atoms. How that happens is uh, the subject of chemistry. But because these molecules are complex, because they have a complex structure, it sometimes does scare you because it's a very big structure on the blackboard. But you have to break it down, break down the structures. In my slides today, I'm not going to show any structure, so don't worry. I, I was actually told not to show slides, should just to interact with you, which is also fine. So I would show minimum slides, though I have a lot of slides, I will only show minimum slides, which are required. I just kept them for reference. So the talk will be more or less on on an interactive platform. So the first slide, of course, tells a little bit about myself, okay? And uh, that I was, that I joined Ashoka only eight months before, or seven and a half months before is not captured in the title. So I joined only on October 2022. So I'm very young in Ashoka. But of course I'm not young, because I worked in several other institutions, as you can see, most notably, my first part of my life is actually put in the middle. My first and the, and the, and the most of my life is put in the middle in National Chemical Laboratory, Pune. So I, I am actually belong to Pune. And then I moved to, after 33 years of service there and retiring as a director, I moved to IIT Bombay as a professor for two and a half years. Uh, by that time, in the middle of my tenure, I got another job at IISCR Kolkata as a director. It is good to have a job as director. So I, I went there, right? I hope all of you know IIT, all of you know ISAR, right? Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research. So, and uh, many of you may not know NCL, but it is a part of the CSIR family of laboratories. So I have been into different laboratories, different types, 
and it has been great. But what is even more interesting uh, to tell you is that with my background in school, many would not have taken chemistry. And I decided to take chemistry. That is very important. I was a five-year integrated master's student. I should introduce myself after school at IIT Kanpur. So IIT Bombay was not the first IIT that I saw. I was a, as an alumni of IIT Kanpur, and then I moved to for PhD in India, and so on. So uh, the, the point that I'm trying to say is that I had a JE rank, which is, I went through IIT Kanpur at the joint entrance examination, as all of you know, in 1972. So it almost looks like a very old story. So I had a JE rank of around 200, okay? Uh, all India rank, with that rank, I could have got any engineering, like electrical. I still remember five IITs, which are really checkered at that time, disciplines, or IIT Kanpur electrical engineering. Remember, there, that was the era when there was no computer science. There was no computer engineering. So I had electrical engineering at IIT Kanpur. I could have taken electronics and telecommunication at IIT Kharagpur, chemical in IIT Bombay, chemical engineering, mechanical at Madras and textile in Delhi. Those are five very, very important departments in each of the IITs. Of course, I decided to take none. And I took up five-year integrated masters, which was offered along with those engineering degrees. I hope you understand. All of you understand English well? Yeah, OK. So I decided to take up five-year integrated masters, which was a kind of shock. I hope you understand. Even those days, it was a shock that after getting into IIT, doing well in the JE, why you are taking MSc? And that too, chemistry. Subject that you don't like, apparently. I don't know. I'm told. I, I, I hope that is wrong, actually. Uh, I took up chemistry. Then they asked me that, look, I mean, what is your strong subject even among science? I said, physics and maths. If you're not strong in physics and maths, you can't get a high JE rank. I mean, I, not, trust me, if you're not good in physics and maths, you can't get into IIT, even today. So you have to be good in physics and maths. So I was. Then the question is, then why do you take chemistry? If chemistry is your weakest subject. I remember, you remember, I hope, see, uh, I had a discussion. So I said, yes, chemistry is my weakest subject, exactly for the reasons that some of you don't like chemistry, because school chemistry is not taught well. Then why do I take chemistry? I said, that's the, that's the reason I took chemistry. Because chemistry is my weak subject, and physics and maths are my strong subjects. I can bring my expertise of physics and maths into chemistry, which would be like bringing in what we call interdisciplinary today. So I think it was very, very important that we bring in additional expertise from another field to chemistry or your core subject, and then, then the subject will actually improve. So please do not worry if you are going into a weaker subject. Your strength in other subjects will actually add value to that subject. Because what I can do, I, that was my argument, as a physicist, or as a physics and maths knowledge, is something that a person who is very strong in chemistry and weak in physics and maths will not be able to do. And that is where you can do something new, something innovative. And it, this was a very difficult question. I gave that difficult answer at the age of 17, just at almost your age, a little higher. And, and my counselor was very impressed. He, I, even the counselor did not think of such an answer. So he said, OK, you can take chemistry. However, with a rider, that if you do well after first year, you can still change the subject. Unfortunately, that rider still exists in all the IITs, though the IITs are now trying to take it away. So I, that is with that, I went to Kanpur IIT, being weak in chemistry, to take a five-year integrated master's in chemistry in a department which was very strong in chemistry. The faculties are extremely strong in chemistry. So you can imagine the challenges that I had. I was rather weak in chemistry. But they had integrated course, so first five semesters we did physics, maths, engineering. So 
you know, it kind of neutralizes your disadvantage. And eventually I realized that I could get into chemistry and look at chemistry in a way that a physics person or a maths person or a computational person will look at. And I actually became today a quantum chemist, which is basically application of quantum mechanics, physics to chemistry, and a computational chemist, which means I do computational science, I do chemistry in computer, which is called in silico chemistry. I don't dirty my hands. I don't have to go to lab. And yet, I can predict properties and functions of chemical molecules. So that's brilliant. Many people don't like chemistry because they have to go to lab. So I could still find a way to become a chemist, but sitting in the computer. So that's really, so I, it's, it's an amalgamation of computer science, computational science, I should say, and chemistry. So that is what we are doing. You can do that for biology today, what is called computational biology is very similar. Tools are also very, very similar, and, and so on. So there is not much of a difference when you come to computational science. And I believe computational science is an integrator of all science, all sciences. That interdisciplinary nature is extremely important. Though I didn't want to show too many slides, but I will probably show this slide about Ashoka University. So I, I hope many of you have already seen these slides in the Ashoka University website. So that's Ashoka University. Uh, they are not too much older than you. Uh, this is, of course, uh, Ashoka University is a liberal arts, first of its kind in India. And then why you study science at Ashoka, I must tell you, because we have uh, uh, Experiment, computation, mathematical, theoretical research, all together we innovate in teaching. Most are interdisciplinary researchers which they bring to their classrooms. So chemistry needed to understand modern biology and, and so on. And it is not chemistry for chemistry, biology for biology. The fundamental principles are taught. Mathematics is taught as a language that connects all the disciplines of a subject. And today, data science is becoming very, very important. All of you know artificial intelligence, machine learning, and they have become extremely important in each of these disciplines. So chemistry, as I told, is a central science. And this is something that you have to believe it is so, and I will show you why. Everything that you see is all chemistry. In fact, yesterday, we had a very large chemistry lab experiment for the YSP students also. And, and that was exciting. Chemistry plays a role in energy solution, and I'm going to come to that. Sunlight, electricity, chemistry has a role. Understand substance. All substance consists of molecules. So of course, everything is chemistry, because molecule is chemistry. So what is not chemistry? And that is very, very important. I also paraphrase, what can you not do in computer? It's very, very important. So that's how it connects chemistry and computer. Computer, you can simulate almost anything in this world today. So chemistry and computer is very, very important. So what in the world is not chemistry? I think that is something that if you look at yourself, your dress, building, paper, computer, everything is chemistry because they have molecules. So molecules are the heart of chemistry. So that is the reason I, I, I put this as atoms to molecules to matter, building a matter. How, how the matter comes from atoms and molecules. So I think that is very, very important. But I must say today that chemistry is not just about that everything is there. Because everything is chemistry, chemistry today is extremely important for sustainable earth. Sustaining an earth, renewable energy. I hope you understand what is renewable energy. Uh, can you give me one example? Huh? Solar, hydro. Well, I'm not very sure about hydro because water, you have to worry about water. Nuclear, nuclear energy is okay, but nuclear, they will run out Bio eventually. Uranium, uranium. Yeah, bio, bio waste to fuel. That is, of course, uh, because we are going to continue to generate bio waste. Sunlight, tidal, tidal waves, wind. Wind is always there. However, you, you convert wind to electricity, wind will not go away, right? It's, it's a sustainable thing. Anything else? This is a very important energy that people are talking about, huh? Sorry, geothermal. Yes, could be. 
Anything else? Very important. People are thinking of running a car, running a car with that energy. Huh? Hydrogen. Right, hydrogen. See, the reason hydrogen is, you might wonder, is hydrogen sustainable? Because hydrogen can be produced from algae, bio waste, several things. Production generation of hydrogen is difficult, but it is not impossible. Then, if you utilize that hydrogen in running car, that will be wonderful for various reasons. One is that that's not only a fuel, but it's a clean fuel. When hydrogen burns, what do you get? When hydrogen burns, what do you get? Water, right? All of you know. Hydrogen, oxygen gives you water. I mean, even if you don't like chemistry, you will know this, right? So, you generate clean energy. So, that is one very important thing. But what is the difficulty? Difficulty is that the hydrogen can be generated. But hydrogen generation is rather unsafe. When you generate hydrogen, if you don't take care of safety, it may explode because it very quickly burns with oxygen and generates a lot of energy. So what you do is actually generate hydrogen somewhere else, not inside the car, then store the hydrogen, and preferably in a solid surface, and then put the ignition. When the ignition, you put the key in the car, the hydrogen comes out, burns, and, and the energy is produced. That was the idea. Now there are a lot of bottlenecks. You might wonder why is the hydrogen cars not available? I can tell you a story. 2012, 2012, in Piccadilly Square in London, I have, all of you know Piccadilly Square, right? In London, I was there and in a, on a Sunday afternoon, I got into a demo hydrogen bus. It was a hydrogen bus, demo. I got into that bus. I actually went for a few kilometers, came back. I wonder, after 10 years, the cars are still not in the market. Why? The reason is the storage. If you store hydrogen, you have to store it well. Otherwise, hydrogen will diffuse. If you store it well, then the problem is to bring it back by the ignition key. So for example, if it is very strongly bound to my hand, then I have to take it out. So to take it out, you need energy penalty, right? You need to give energy. And then the issue also is how quickly the hydrogen comes out. So there are two things. One is the energy required to break the hydrogen bond. Another is how quickly the hydrogen gets dissolved. Now, you can immediately see there are twin problems. If I do not absorb very well, then the hydrogen will go away before you can use it. If you, if you do absorb it well, then it will be difficult to take out. I hope you understand the twin problem. And that is why we call it reversible storage. Reversible means you must store and reabsorb with equal facility. How, how is it possible? It's not possible. As you know, there are two kinds of absorption. I don't know if you have done in science, physics or something. One is called physical absorption. Have you heard of it? Physics option. If, you, if not, please note, Physics option is a very weak absorption on any material. Some gas comes, very weakly bound. Another is a chemical absorption, which is of course very strong binding, because there is a chemical bond, which I will explain later, chemical bond which gets formed. Now, both are bad, because in physical absorption, the hydrogen will diffuse in air, whereas chemical absorption, difficult to get the hydrogen back. So, what do you do? And that is why it has not yet been a technology. If you ask me, how will it become a technology? There are a lot of people who are working on hydrogen. And in fact, one of the very important things that people have now realized, that I must have a material to which hydrogen binds, such that it is neither physical adsorption nor chemical adsorption, somewhere in between. So let me tell you some numbers. What is a chemical adsorption? Typically, 50, 60 kilojoules per mole. Have you heard of kilojoules as a unit of energy? Have you heard of mole? M-O-L-E? You heard? What is a mole? Avogadro number of molecules, right? Is a mole. So if you have that much, one per one mole, if 60 kilojoules come out, 50 kilojoules come out, or higher, it is chemical adsorption. Physical adsorption on that scale is only 1 to 5 kilojoules. 
So people have realized that get a material which is probably 15 to 30 kilojoules per mole, somewhere in between. Then it might be good. But people are not able to find it. It's amazing. And if you find that, it's also important that the hydrogen must come out at a good rate. Otherwise, car will not move. It will just stop. And that's a big challenge. In fact, you know there's a Department of Energy in USA that is called US DOE. You might have heard DOE. They have put a target that at room temperature, if you can store hydrogen 7 to 8 percent by weight, that means if I have a 1 kg of material, 7 to 8 percent, which is 70 grams or 80 grams of hydrogen should be stored. Now that has not been possible at a room temperature. People have done it at 78 Kelvin. Liquid nitrogen, liquid helium, of course, they are very good, but they can't do it at room temperature. Today, people are, have materials which have only 1 to 2 percent. Yeah, just and come back. So 7 to 8 percent, unless it is 7 to 8 percent, it will not become a technology. Why? Because to have a technology, it must be cheaper than the price of the petrol. Because today, petrol is already available, unless petrol completely vanishes from the earth. It will not become a technology. So that is the problem why hydrogen is not coming in the market. Okay? If you can get a material, and, and I, trust me, it will require chemistry for that. If you can get a material which will actually bind hydrogen at 7 to 8% at room temperature with a facility that it can go out quickly, kinetics is also good, I'm sure you'll get a Nobel Prize. I'm sure. And not only that, the car companies will chase you. So this is one field where Saraswati and Lakshmi, both will come to you. Not just Saraswati. You understand what I'm saying? Lakshmi is the goddess of wealth, and Saraswati is the goddess of knowledge. Both will come to you. So wonderful area to work with, but it will require good chemistry. Without chemistry, you cannot do it. Because you need the material, you need to know binding, and hydrogen is such a simple gas that you can do every kind of study to find it, but all over the world people have not found it. Just imagine how difficult it is a problem. I'm just giving you a grand challenge problem. So that will give me not only renewable energy, but also clean energy. Yes, you have, you have a question. I just want to ask, uh, what are the current hydrogen challenges? For? What are the current hydrogen challenges? Yeah, so, so one is the energy of binding. People are looking at 15 to 30 kilojoules per mole. That is one. Second is the rate of desorption. That is called kinetics. I don't know if you have heard this word kinetics. Kinetics is essentially rate of a reaction. That a reaction takes place, no doubt, how quickly it takes place. That's also important. So the kinetics of a reaction. So what we actually do is to see on a given substance how many molecules of hydrogen can get bound, because that will give me a percentage. We also need 7 to 8 percent. So that's the third parameter at room temperature, 7 to 8 percent. So those are the three parameters uh, which will make it work. Yes. Uh, I have another question. There is a startup in India started by some IIT graduates. They will basically take water vapor from the sun and convert it to water and take it through some special process. And they use some technology similar to like the required for clogging of hydrogen. Do you yeah. think that might work? No, no. So there are a lot of startups, not one. Yeah. Hydrogen energy is a very big thing. In fact, if you look at our G20 uh, and S20 discussion, hydrogen is one of the major discussion, how to get hydrogen energy. Because everybody knows the importance of hydrogen energy, but the technology, what I'm trying to say, unless you achieve these parameters, technology will not come out. Technology, remember, is ju not just knowing how to do it. When it becomes a technology is when you know how to do it, and that is cheaper than the others in the market. So in this case, it will be even compared with petrol, because petrol is a fuel. So it has still not become a technology. You are right that a lot of people are working, hydrogen startup, startups are the way to do it, so there is no question about it. But so what I'm trying to say for a sustainable earth, these two are very, very important, not only renewable energy, but also clean energy. Then the third thing is a climate change. Today, of course, a lot of people are talking of climate change. I hope you have seen in the discussion. There's all political leaders, everybody, everybody's world, worldwide are worried about climate change, global warming. Why does climate change? Again, because of certain molecules like carbon dioxide, 
going in the air from industries and that is heating up ozone layer depletion all of you have heard this again all of these if you have to mitigate them all of these will require good chemistry and i will tell you that like carbon dioxide itself is a good example how to mitigate it it will require very good chemistry so no climate change can take without chemistry and of course this also leads to environment when you have good these molecules are not there your environment gets purified if you have sulfur dioxide you have to remove that so environment cleaning also would require good chemistry and of course i need not talk about the last one healthcare healthcare means getting drugs i think in the during the covid time itself we have seen how much work had to be done for getting a vaccine but if you have a drugs which you just take today and covid will not come to you that's wonderful such a thing is still not there that we just take a drug preventive drug in fact what is interesting is that there has been no new antibiotics since 1960s no new range of antibiotics and that is really a tough thing so people are getting resistant to the current antibiotics it is called anti amr i hope you have heard this word amr anti microbial resistance so that means you take too much antibiotics so doctors always said don't take antibiotics too much antibiotics is not good because you become resistant to the antibiotics right so you need to have newer and newer molecules remember only biology will never give you a drug because at the end of the day a drug is a molecule which has to be synthesized in the lab whose interaction with the biology our system has to be understood and that will require a combination of good chemistry and biology so remember good chemistry and biology is very very important so healthcare so all of these which are going to sustain the earth are uh, very important and chemistry plays a very very important role and that is the reason i am saying that when when the school level people get worried about not taking chemistry as a subject i get worried for the earth because one of the reasons many of these things are not happening in india because we have not been very strong in chemistry so mathematics alone will not give you unless you you understand the molecules how molecules are made the bondings and interaction between the molecules okay so it's very important to realize uh, how important is chemistry today of course chemistry in daily life i mean this is a cartoon but you know from the morning toothpaste to whatever you are doing you have all kinds of chemistry that you do and this is of course a structure of the toothpaste for example uh, it may think rather complicated but it is not complicated i hope all of these elements you know right sodium oxygen phosphorus right fluorine fluorine is very very important for uh, toothpaste for uh, because that really cleans so uh, so how it happens and so on so the day starts with toothpaste you have a breakfast whatever you do yeast the glucose ethanol they are all being chemical reaction so one does not have to know everything but what i'm trying to tell through this is that everything is chemistry including emotions all of these are chemistry and that is why i place myself in the national lab uh, where i work in the national chemical laboratory let me tell you a little bit about the history of chemistry and this is very quick slide before i come to the atoms and molecule the chemistry started uh, quite you know sometime back people didn't know how the reaction takes place for example if i keep an iron maybe by some thousand years iron will become gold right that will be wonderful how to hasten that process then that is where the chemistry of came the days of alchemy have you heard of alchemy we started in the middle east actually people didn't know what is happening but they only know there is a conversion from one substance to another substance and in fact in the medieval period the chemistry started and then slowly the modern chemistry started around the 17th century with this very very famous person have you heard of robert boyle boyle's law have you heard of boyle's law in chemistry in physical chemistry boyle's law charles law no okay that's interesting have you heard of boyle's law yeah have you do you have do you know 
the uh, one very important equation, the pressure and volume, if you multiply for a given substance, it is equal to temperature times R and N. PV equal to NRT. Have you heard of this? Good, good. So, so if I have a constant pressure, what will happen? Volume will be proportional to temperature. If you have a constant volume, pressure will be temp proportional to temperature. So one is a Boyle's, one is Charles, Charles' law. Right? Charles has a similar, the Charles' law is there. But Boyle, very interestingly, he published this very interesting paper, an article, the skeptical chemist, on the distinction between chemistry and alchemy. So this is when alchemy did not know what it is doing. This is when Boyle said that we will be able to understand why it is happening. In fact, what is very, very important is why certain things happen. And in fact, school level, you, do, you are not taught that. And that is the reason people get put off with the chemistry. It just looks like some facts. But so Boyle started distinguishing, and he actually produced this very important Boyle's law, the relation between the pressure and volume. The pressure and volume is basically at a constant temperature. PV is constant, so pressure is proportional to 1 by volume. Henry Cavendish, I please, you, these are all YouTube things, very interesting videos. Henry Cavendish discovered hydrogen, the same hydrogen that I'm talking of. Henry Cavendish discovered hydrogen as a colorless, odorless gas that burns and forms an explosive mixture with air. Ima imagine 1766 when hydrogen was discovered. It's such a simple gas, but it is not known. So, so chemistry is much more modern than physics. I mean, Newton's law had already come, remember. So people didn't know hydrogen. I mean, today you cannot believe that. Uh, you may think Newton's law is more difficult, but chemistry uh, is, is, it came much later. 1778, there's a very famous scientist called Anton Lavoisier. Have you heard of Lavoisier? Yeah. Right. He is called the father of modern chemistry many times. Lavoisier kind of rec uh, actually brought oxygen in the picture and recognizes the important role in combustion. So anywhere there is a combustion, there is oxygen. Like hydrogen, when I am saying burning, people didn't know. He only saw that hydrogen burns. How hydrogen burns? Through oxygen. Oxygen was discovered much later. These are all molecules which are there in the nature. It is just that people didn't know what their names are, what, 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 what are those molecules. So that took time. 1787, Charles Law, temperature and volume of a gas, then pressure and volume similarly. Very importantly, 1800, Alessandro Volta, he discovered the first chemical battery. Today you are talking of battery. The first battery was discovered more than 200 years back, only in 1800. So I think these are some of the very interesting history. 1828, a very important synthesis took place. That is called the synthesis of urea. Have you heard of urea as a compound? Urea was synthesized, and this was the beginning of what is now called organic chemistry, the first synthesis of urea. In fact, interestingly, urea was synthesized accidentally. What do you mean by accidentally? They did not want to synthesize urea. They wanted to do something else. Suddenly, as a byproduct, they saw its urea. So many, many of the hist uh, anecdotes in history, if you see, came out accidentally. That means people didn't want to do it. One of the important accidental discoveries is mi mi microbes. In fact, one lens grinder actually saw, was, he was a lens grinder. He suddenly saw something in the water, and they became the microbes. It is a Dutch lens grinder. So you don't need to be practicing science to become a scientist. It's very, very important. You can do science even without practicing scientists. Because you may accidentally discover something. So anytime you discover something, you are a scientist. We always think of formal training, but you don't need a formal training to become scientists. You may discover. So, so people like that discovered several things. John Dalton, Dalton's law. Joseph Gay-Lussac, I don't know if you have heard this. Gay-Lussac is the first person who discovered that water has two parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen by volume. All of you know water is H2O. But this was actually first done by Gay Lussac. Avogadro, I hope, have you heard of Avogadro? Yes. Avogadro's law, in fact, the, the periodic table, if you remember the periodic table, uh, and Avogadro did a lot of work uh, before the periodic table came in. I'm going to talk of periodic table. Lord Kelvin, J.J. Thompson, J.J. Thompson discovered electron in 1897. Yeah, 100 years after battery. Many, many of us think that the electron conduction is there in the battery, 
But battery was discovered 1800, don't forget. And 1897, J.J. Thompson discovered electron. Then, of course, Maria Curie, Pierre Curie, isolated radium and polonium from pitch blend. So this is very important for the, for the, radio, for the nuclear thing. Mendeleev, he is the one who published the first modern periodic table. First modern periodic table. And in fact, Lothar Mayer kind of discovered it first, an early version. But 16, six known elements are put in these uh, Mendeleev's thing. This is the Mendeleev's from the Mendeleev's handwriting. So you can see it's, it's not English, yeah? So, which question mark? Oh, there are certain elements he could not identify. So those are the question marks. But he said there is an element with part. So these are basically the atomic num numbers. Mass of the uh, nucleus, the proton and this. Hubbard and Bosch, I must come back to this. Another Nobel Prize winning problem. Hubbard and Bosch, I hope all of you know ammonia, right? Yes. Ammonia is a very, very important product. So ammonia was built out of nitrogen and hydrogen. I hope all of you know ammonia uh, molecule, NH3, right? Nitrogen and hydrogen. Hubbard and Bosch first discovered nitrogen ammonia, which is, which is still used with industry, but it's a terrible catalyst. You know what is a catalyst? Catalyst is what speeds up reaction. So if you just leave nitrogen and hydrogen, it will not make ammonia, unless you use a catalyst. But unfortunately, the Hubbard and Boss catalyst works at a very extreme temperature and pressure, 400 degrees centigrade, high pressure, and so on. So much so that the entire world power, I don't know if you believe it or not, entire world power, 50%, is actually spent in synthesis of ammonia. So imagine if you can get a catalyst, just think of the problem now. Nitrogen, hydrogen, make ammonia. If you can get a catalyst, which will do at a room temperature, or even 100 degrees centigrade, 200 degrees centigrade, and some pressure, it will convert that to ammonia, and cut down the wall power to maybe 20%, from 50 or 25%, what will happen? How the world will change? So much energy saving. So this is another problem which will be a combination of Lakshmi and Saraswati. Where you good discovery, good knowledge, and of course, a lot of industry will come to you. A lot of industry will come to you because ammonia is very, very important. So you will be rich. You will get a patent and you will become very, very rich. So I think this is a, this is a very important problem to, to find and substitute for what Hubbard and Bosch did. But remember Hubbard, what Hubbard and Bosch did was amazing because that's the way that the ammonia is still produced. And imagine 200 years, the process is still in operation. Of course, Einstein did Brownian motion. I will not talk about Einstein here. Einstein, of course, all of you know, he did a lot of things, including photoelectric effect, Brownian motion, theory of relativity. He's a, yeah, he, he's science, basically. Robert Millikan, Sorensen, he invented pH. Have you heard of pH? Yeah, it measures acidity. So this entire pH concept, how much proton is there, was, was discovered in 1909. Then, this is where I will start on the atoms to molecule. Bohr introduced the first proper model of atom, which actually worked for hydrogen, hydrogen atom. It says that you have a nucleus, you have a, um, the electron moves at different orbits, and, and, and that gives you the Bohr model of the hydrogen. Bohr, of course, called it orbit. Later, we realized that these are not orbits. They have to be called orbitals in actual quantum mechanics when quantum mechanics came. And I will tell you the distinction. Bohr model, however, did not work for more than hydrogen atom. So when you went to helium, when you go to higher atoms, Bohr's model did not work. So it's very important to realize that Bohr's model was a very restrictive model. But it's a very important invention in, in physics. Then Gilbert Lewis, I'll talk about him. James Chadwick discovered neutron. Watson and Crick, uh, the structure of DNA. Many of you might have seen DNA, right? Do you know DNA? In biology, so, so you can see DNA is also chemistry, right? So there is no difference between chemistry and biology, except in biology, you don't know, want to know the structure. You only know the, remember the name. But if you have a membrane, that is structure. So anytime you have a structure of a molecule, in terms of atoms, where the atoms are rearranging, that's chemistry. So chemistry is building molecule from atoms. So that is very, very important. Chemistry is not about remembering the structures. 
chemistry is about understanding how these molecules are made. So one of the persons who actually did a lot of work in the understanding is called Linus Pauli. Have you heard of Pauli? You have heard Pauli? Who heard? You heard? Why did you hear Pauli? Oh, very good, very good, very good. You are way ahead of time. Yeah. Pauling scale, Mullikan, Mullikan also has a scale, Robert Mullikan. Right. So Pauling actually started to say which atoms in periodic table are more electronegative. What is electronegative? It means it has a tendency to pull electron towards itself more than the other atoms. So Pauling started giving a scale and Pauling with that scale actually he started looking at a chemical bond much more than electronegativity. That was a small work but he first time did chemical bond. He had a very, very famous paper, The Nature of Chemical Bond. The Nature of Chemical Bond which became extremely popular, Pauling's work. This is G.N. Lewis who also contributed to chemical bond, how molecules are formed out of atoms. G.N. Lewis was again a very, very famous scientist but unfortunately, Lewis wrote a very famous book and he talked of sharing of electron pair and we're going to come to that and particularly the octet rule. Have you heard of the octet rule? Yes. Right? So every atom will have eight electrons. So that was actually done by G. N. Lewis. Unfortunately, this person was so famous, he did so many things, but he did not get Nobel Prize. That was very unfortunate. He was nominated 33 times. They say 31, 33, I don't know exact number of times to the Nobel Prize, but he was never selected. So if you don't get Nobel Prize, don't get worried. You are still in a good company, right? You are a company of G.N. Lewis, who also did not get Nobel Prize. Despite doing so much work, and Lewis also worked on radioactivity, so many other things. So Ernest Rutherford, another person who actually worked on disintegration of elements, chemistry of radioactive substances, very famous. Michael Faraday. Have you heard of Michael Faraday? Yes. Faraday is an amazing person. In fact, yeah, law of electrolysis. What is Faraday? Right. So that's why I'm saying, is he a physicist or a chemist? What do you say? He didn't study. Right. But he was a, he was everything. Right? He was a physicist, he was a chemist. So I think I, that's a very good question, a good point. Do you need to study <laughs> to become a good physicist or a good chemist? I don't know. I mean, I can tell you in literature, certainly you don't need to study. Rabindranath Tagore, brilliant example, who dropped out of school and became such a great uh, person in literature. Science probably have to study, but there are people who didn't study enough, like Michael Faraday, and discovered so many things. Faraday is a one brilliant example of an interdisciplinary scientist. I can't call chemistry. I mean, if you talk of physics versus chemistry to Faraday, I mean, it is stupid. He doesn't care what is physics and what is that. You decide. He went on discovering. I think that is very, very important. So he had a law of electrolysis. He had these electromagnetic things. So Faraday, but very important work of Faraday, in the very early days, he was an assistant to Humphrey Davy. Have you heard of Humphrey Davy? Ah, so Humphrey Davy had a, had a glass washer. You know, know the story. Humphrey Davy or somebody, yes. Faraday used to go, right, right. And then he became. Good, good, good. So Humphrey Davy, actually, uh, when he lost his glass washer, Faraday came, Faraday, Humphrey Davy initially said, I don't have, I don't have anything, no job. Then his glass was left. Then Faraday called him. Just imagine the story. In those days, there was no mobile phone. So he had to call, somehow he had to call him, come, work, will you work with me? Faraday agreed. And what was the designation? Can you believe? Chief glass washer. The designation that was given to Faraday was the chief glass washer in the lab of Humphrey Davy. And he accepted it. I don't know how many of you will accept that after getting a degree. Okay, you will say, oh, this is a bad job. I will glass washer. But while doing glass washing, he actually discovered two new chlorides of carbon. The unbelievable person. Carbon tetrachloride, carbon chloride. He discovered two new chlorides. And then later on, he became very, very famous. He made the experiments in the diffusion of gases and, and so on and so forth. I mean, he succeeded in liquefying several gases. He investigated alloys of steel. 
produce several new kinds of glass. So imagine, is he a metallurgical engineering? Is he a physicist? Is he a chemist? There is no name. So today, when I say, oh, I don't like chemistry, I don't like physics, I, mean, I, I don't understand this. There is no boundary. And I'm trying to tell you that there are people so many years back who did that. So Michael Faraday, of course, was eventually known as a chemist, but he did so much work in the physics and, and he was a great personality. Even today, there are Faraday lectures in UK. Faraday lectures are very, very famous. So uh, to do science, of course, you require scientific temper. And very important to realize that chemistry moves on two wheels. One is curiosity, one is utility. And I have been telling about this. Utility is very important part of chemistry. So renewable energy, environment, running car, materials, smart materials. So chemistry moves on two wheels, curiosity and utility. A very famous statement by George Whiteside, again from, uh, from US, and, and is very important to understand chemistry that you have synthesis, you have properties, you have structure and dynamics. And I think these are all chemistry, is very often called central science because it connects so many things. So if you are a chemist, you can get so many jobs. You can do theory, you can do nanoscience, you can do polymer, environment, education, toxicology. So it's an amazing thing that if you want to go to forensic, you still require chemistry. So many of the subjects can be connected by chemistry. So many people get worried, but if you get educated in chemistry, you can do lots of other things. You don't have to be a researcher. So when I come to chemistry, of course, the most important thing is to build molecules from atoms. So I want to spend a little bit time. So you have already heard of atoms, right? Some of you have already heard of atoms? What is an atom? Can you tell me what is an atom? Yeah, just tell. Whatever you, whatever you think of atom, tell me. Okay, that is one statement. What is it? What, what does atom contain? Can somebody tell me what does atom contain? Yes. It contains a nucleus which is positively charged and heavy and an electron. The problem is how is the electron distributed in the molecule? So Bohr thought the electron moves in an orbit, circular orbit or whatever in different orbits, n equal to 1, n equal to 2, he kept on, but that is wrong. Unfortunately, Bohr was not right. Bohr theory was right only for hydrogen atom. As soon as Bohr went to helium atom, where has two electrons, Bohr was wrong. He could not describe what the two electrons do. Then came the quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics actually said, oh, sorry. So the quantum mechanics said that it is not the orbits around which they move, but electrons like any other particle have only a probability and there is no certainty. I hope some of you have heard what is called uncertainty principle. Have you heard? Very famous physicist, who, what is the name of the physicist? Ah, very good, Werner Heisenberg. I hope all of you know that is the golden time of physics when quantum mechanics was born. Heisenberg said, there is an uncertainty principle. I don't know where the electron is. Albert Einstein was furious. You know, there was a big, big conference in Solvay in Belgium. Albert Einstein said, are you mad? I don't know where the electron is. How is it possible? He said, yeah, you don't know what the particle is. You have only what is called a probability density of finding the particle. So I don't know where the atom is. So when Bohr said it is moving like this, it must be wrong. How can you know that it is moving here or this radius? That electron density is there all around the atom, all around. There's a probability only of finding. And that probability was described by a function which was actually called an orbital. So it's very interesting that orbitals define the probability density. So you have 1s, you might have heard this, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, and these orbitals can have two electrons, each orbital, up and down spin, and you keep on filling by what is called the Aufbau principle. Aufbau was a very famous scientist, that the first two electrons will go in 1s, next two electrons will go in 2s, and so on and so forth. 
But those orbitals doesn't mean that the electrons are here. It is just that the probability density of that, those electrons are described. So the densities are different. So this is the most difficult part of quantum mechanics. And you can imagine Einstein had difficulty in understanding this. Einstein, you might think that the photo, photo I hope all of you know photoelectric effect got a Nobel Prize. And that was the beginning of quantum mechanics. But you should also know that Einstein was the strongest disbeliever in quantum mechanics. He said, my results are correct, but your interpretation is wrong. There must be another theory which will explain my results more simply. He could never find it. Unfortunately, Albert Einstein was a very unhappy man. Because he said quantum mechanics is wrong. It was Schrodinger. I hope all of you know Arvind Schrodinger. Warner Heisenberg. Who challenged, who said quantum mechanics is right? You show that it is wrong. You find out another theory, which will explain all results systematically. Einstein could not find. In fact, there was a conference in 1930s, much later than the Solvay conference, where a lot of these big people assembled. I think there are maybe 17 or 18 Nobel laureates. And every day, morning, Einstein gets up and comes up with a rider. If your quantum mechanics is right, you know, show me this. How will you show? That is called Einstein's paradox. Very famous Einstein's paradox. And then by the afternoon, Schrodinger and Heisenberg work out, come up with the solution. Next day morning, again Einstein gets up. Another paradox. The entire conference goes haywire. On one of the days, or middle days, when he gets up, Wolfgang Pauli, have you heard of Pauli? Pauli is exclusion principle. Some of you might have heard in chemistry. Pauli was a very famous physicist. He was in the chair. He told a very famous statement to Mr. Mr. Einstein, will you please shut up? I think you don't understand quantum mechanics. Imagine that to be said to Albert Einstein. And Einstein in his very characteristic way, yes, Mr. Pauli, I don't seem to understand quantum mechanics. You know, Einstein has this characteristic way here, going. He's a wonderful person, actually. And he really, it's not that he didn't understand what probability means. It's not like our mathematics. He understood mathematics. But he didn't believe in the philosophy. He said, this seems to be a cooked up theory. This can't be right. But he could never find another theory to explain everything. And 100 years on, quantum mechanics has survived. In fact, 1926, I must tell you, quantum mechanics, first paper of quantum mechanics was published by Erwin Schrodinger in Zeitschrift for Physics. It was a very famous German, German journal. 2026, people are now preparing to have 100 years of quantum mechanics. So you will find lots of interesting seminars, conferences, which are being planned. And many of those quantum mechanics is not physics. Quantum mechanics is also chemistry. It can be in biology everywhere. I, I believe in last 200 years or 300 years, quantum mechanics was the biggest game-changing science that was done. You know, I, I, I may put myself in line of a controversy, but I think that was the most interesting theory that was done. So with those orbitals, with the probability density, atoms were defined. But when I say hydrogen has 1s orbital, it doesn't mean that it is here from the nucleus. That's a wrong mistake. You can say the density is maximum here. But there's a possibility of electron being anywhere. And that is very important. Of course, it goes down as you go away from the nucleus. The probability goes down. That, that happens. And then when you have two atoms, let's say two atoms, those atomic orbitals overlap to create new orbitals. But they're still orbitals. You still have the probability density, which describes the molecule. A very simple example is two hydrogen atoms coming together to form hydrogen molecule. And how does it happen is actually described again by quantum mechanics that atoms overlap to form a molecule such that the energy is less than the sum of the atomic energies. So if I have a hydrogen molecule, if it is formed, it must be, it must have an energy which is less than the sum of the two hydrogen atoms, H plus H. So that is a very important part. So it is a stable molecule. Then there are lots of bonds, which is what G. N. Lewis worked on. So one is covalent bond. Example is hydrogen. 
Hydrogen is a perfect covalent bond. In fact, all homonuclear diatomic molecules have covalent bonds. Do you understand what is homonuclear diatomic molecule? Can somebody tell me? Homonuclear diatomic molecule. Tell me what does it mean? Diatomic means two atoms. Beautiful. What is homonuclear? Same nuclear. So hydrogen molecule is an example of a homonuclear diatomic molecule. Agree? You can have another molecule like C2, carbon, dicarbon, two carbon atoms, two boron atoms, two di lithium, Li, Li. So many they are there, but if you have a perfect H2 or Li2, it is a covalent bond, which means the two atoms equally share the electron when the molecule is formed. So that is called the covalent bond, but there are bonds which are ionic like sodium chloride. What happens in sodium chloride? He was talking of electronegativity, the Pauling scale of electronegativity. Chlorine is so much electronegative compared to sodium that the electron of the sodium is pulled to the chlorine. So chlorine has an extra electron, so to say, it becomes anion. What is an anion? It has one extra electron and sodium becomes a cation, which is a positive charge and then there is electrostatic interaction. So such things happen between two atoms if one of them has a much larger electronegativity than the other. Then there are bonds like coordinate bonds, boron, hydride with ammonia. So where ammonia has extra electrons, which is simply given to boron hydride and they share these two electrons. So in coordinate bond, what happens the following? Let me tell you what is happens in covalent bond. C has an electron, I have an electron. What we do, I give the electron, C gives the electron, these two electrons we equally share. But you may wonder, okay, if it's equally shared, you still get only one electron, right? Why do you want to do this? But that sharing lowers our energy. Both of our energy. In the coordinate bond, I have two electrons, C has nothing. I become a dative, I become a donor. I give all my two electrons. I said, okay, you don't have electron, don't worry. I have two, we'll share. I mean, you do that all the time, right? So that is coordinate bond. So this is an interesting idea because ammonia has two extra electrons. That is called lone pair. And boron hydride doesn't have any. So this gives an electron, they share. So it is called dative bond sometimes. Dative means one is a donor. One, one donates. And of course, where there is a large electronegativity difference, you have sodium chloride, you have a completely ionic bond. But look at this molecule like water. It has hydrogen and oxygen. There is still an electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen. So hydrogen will pull electron. So now the question is, is it ionic? Is it covalent? And this is a very difficult question because most of the molecules as I have written are a combination of the above, neither purely covalent nor ionic. So this molecule is neither ionic nor covalent. It's a mixture of both. In fact, if you do, if you do a little bit more study, you will find this is more covalent than ionic because the electronegativity difference is not much. So chemistry many times can be understood by the simple concepts of chemical bond. And it's not very difficult. It's not very difficult. If you go to simple molecules, don't go to very large molecules. You'll get lost. Try to understand a very simple molecule like ammonia, water, methane, very simple molecule. Carbon and hydrogen have very close electronegativity. So if you have a methane, is it going to be covalent or is it going to be ionic? I give you an example. Carbon and hydrogen has very similar electronegativity. So methane, CH4, is it going to be covalent or ionic? Covalent, great. It is not going to be ionic because, but the ionicity is not zero. There will be a little bit of ionicity because still there is a difference. Whereas in hydrogen molecule, ionicity will be nearly zero. Although it is possible, but then it will have both H plus, H minus, H minus, H plus, almost cancelling out. What is more interesting is that when a large number of molecules come together, form a material. That is more interesting. Like this table is a material. What is a large number? How many molecules are there in the table, you think? Many. But can you have a guess? Can you tell me how many molecules are there in this bottle? 10 to the power. How will you calculate? It's simple physics. I find it has a water, right? Water has many molecules. I ask you a question. The, I give you the density of the water. One gram per cc. This is possibly what, 200 cc, let's say. 
or 250, 200 cc, I think. How many molecules will be there? How will you calculate? Tell me. Yes, I think you know it. Let me ask from another person. Wait, let me see. I know, I know, you'll be able to tell. Wait, let me see another person. Huh? You have a guess? Yeah, tell me. Plastic, I'm talking water. I'm only asking you how many molecules of water are there. It's a 200 milliliter bottle. How will you calculate? Tell me. Yes. Well, you know the density of water. Right. I know the density of water. And you just told me the volume. You multiply by the... Yeah, yeah, get the so you get the weight. Water, so. so what is saying from density, you get the weight. Right? So it is 200 grams. 200 milliliter is 200 grams. Correct? Right. And then? I know Avogadro is not... No, before that, what do you do? You divide by the molecular weight, which is 18. 200 by 18 is the number of moles that this contains. Each mole has the Avogadro number of molecules. So multiply by that, you get the molecules. Is it clear? So number would be pretty close to Avogadro number. Anyway, I mean 20, 200 divided by 18, whatever it is, you multiply by 10 to the power 23. So 10 to the power 23 will dominate. Correct? So that's a large number. So this table also has Avogadro number, that's for sure. Maybe 10 to the 20, 10 to the 30, 10 to the 28, whatever. It's a very really large number. When you have a large number of molecules, what is happening? It doesn't look like that the quantum mechanics is operating. Does it have an uncertainty? Heisenberg said there is an uncertainty. It has so many electrons. The table doesn't seem to have any uncertainty. I know it's x, y, z coordinate. Right? A cricket ball has so many electrons, does it have an uncertainty? If the ball has uncertainty, there will be no cricket match. How can you claim that the, I, have, I have caught the ball? There is only probability that the ball is here, right? So very interesting question, why does it happen? Why does suddenly this uncertainty vanish when I go to a large number of molecules? Single molecule it is there, two molecules are there, hundred molecules it is there. When it is Avogadro number, that is not there. So that is what I said, degrees of freedom now reduce. So all these molecules cannot move. Because they are so closely packed, because of the inter intermolecular interaction, they behave more classical. So as the system becomes larger and larger, quantum mechanics can be approximated by classical mechanics. You don't need quantum mechanics. You can then say it is classical, so the cricket ball becomes classical, the table becomes classical. And that is the interesting thing when it happens in material. But remember, they are all coming from the molecules. So I am in principle, I can use quantum mechanics. But in practice, I don't need to use because it is too large. So I can make an approximation. So very provocatively, I can say that all classical mechanics itself is an approximation to quantum mechanics. And that is a very interesting thought that you can have. But this, this we actually you build material and materials can be built out of molecules. You can have a small model where molecular structure can be actually shown. Okay? And that is the heart of the, the chemistry or physics or whatever you call it. That's a science. How am I building from atom to molecule to material? So you have to first understand atom, understand molecules, how many molecules make materials, and the quantum properties get reduced. As many molecules come together, quantum properties reduce. So let me ask you a question. If there are 100 atoms or 100 molecules, it is still quantum. It is not large. If it is 1000, it may be still quantum. If it is Avogadro number, it is classical. So now my question is, that's a very interesting question. When does quantum become classical? Is it 1000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million, 10 million? Nobody knows. It is slowly becoming more and more classical. So there is no, no point where I can say it becomes classical. Depending on the computer, and this is where computational chemistry is very important. Depending on the computer, I will say it is now too big. I will declare it is too big for me. So I am going to use classical approximation. If it is cricket ball, it is certainly too big. You don't use quantum mechanics for cricket ball. That is stupid. But nanomaterials, 
I hope all of you have heard nanotechnology, right? Nanomaterials are in that range, which is, I can use quantum mechanics, I can use classical mechanics, depending on the way I'm looking it. So very interesting question, how large is large? And how small is small? When I say large, what do you mean by large? How big? So that's a very interesting thought that lots of good physicists are working on in terms of theory, understanding, the building of concepts. So I think that is something that you people have to realize that when you go from atoms, molecules to materials, how things progressively change. Yeah, I just gave some example of ionic bond, sodium chloride, I told you Na plus Cl minus. This is covalent, however, dichlorine molecule Cl2. There is something very interesting bond which I did not talk about that is called the hydrogen bond. That, so you have two water molecules and one electronegative atom, oxygen, with a chemical bond with hydrogen, but very small bond with another hydrogen here of this water molecule. This is not very strong, this is a very weak bond. This kind of bonding is called the hydrogen bond. It, it, it can bind one water molecule to another water molecule, but they are very weak. I talked of physical adsorption. Remember 1 to 5 kilojoules. These are of that order. So with a slight energy, you can break those bonds. But if you have many, many such water molecules, they will form a bond. So imagine many of you just for, uh, you know, um, hold hands, which are very weak. So anybody can break it. But if you have many such hands, and they come together, then it is very difficult to break. So that is going to happen in all these hydrogen bond clusters. That becomes very interesting chemistry today, supramolecular cluster and so on. Uh, I will not talk about this, but this is an interesting chemistry which you always show. Uh, why does apple turn brown? Right? All of you know this? Oxidation, right? So apple contains iron chemical compounds which react with oxygen and that is basically brown in color, iron oxide. However, there is a very interesting part. You require a catalyst. Just like I tell nitrogen to ammonia, you require a catalyst. Even this does not happen without a catalyst. Unfortunately for you, that catalyst exists within the apple. So as soon as you cut it, oxygen comes in, enzyme comes in, and that is called enzyme, the catalyst. It is called polyphenol oxidase and, and called tyrosinase. It immediately oxidizes. So everything is now there. Now the interesting question is, how do you stop apple from going brown? So remember, you have iron, cut it, oxygen, enzyme. These three are important. So how will you prevent? Forget about oxygen. Somehow remove the oxygen, right? That's one way. Or remove the enzyme. That could be a second way. And that is exactly what is being done here. If you look at this, vitamin C, then you remove the air. So, so sorry, sorry about the slide. You do a vacuum packing, removes water. Dehydration, you, you heat it, water goes up. Why water? Because water is required for polyphenol oxidase to work. So this enzyme requires water to work. So now remove water or kill the enzyme. That is what the heating does. Heating will denature the enzyme. So that are very, so that's why we said clean, high quality cooking utensils. They will all denature the polyphenol oxidase. So there are ways of keeping them. Of course, we do vacuum packing. Of course, if you don't want your chemistry, believe in your chemistry, better eat it. Uh, before, don't cut and keep it because you don't know if your chemistry will work. But try this. You put a vitamin C and keep it. It will not go brown. That's a wonderful chemistry. The apple chemistry. But you learn catalysis. You learn how a reaction takes place. Iron doesn't get oxidized just like this. If I put an iron, will it get oxidized automatically? It will not. It takes years to oxidize. So the oxidation will take place, but it takes a long time. What this polyphenol oxidase does is to hasten it. So if you have a lot of iron pipes, they're not getting oxidized every day. It takes time to get oxidized, of course. After that, you'll see rusted. But if you want to hasten any chemical reaction, that's a very important lesson. You need a catalysis. And catalysis, I must say, is the heart of chemistry. So all that the chemists do is to find catalysis. I talked about nitrogen to ammonia is a catalyst. Even hydrogen storage, in a way, it's a material. Carbon dioxide goes out. You want to convert that into methanol, right? Or formic acid as a fuel. That's what we like to do. 
so that bad things are used for a good thing. But to do that, again, you require a catalyst. If you just put water or CO2, methanol will not form. You have hydrogen, but it will not form. You need a catalyst. So catalysis, remember, is the heart of chemistry. So many times, if you want to understand, you have to understand catalysis. So developing catalysis for a particular process is what the chemists do. And you can imagine how it will have an amazing social impact for all of this. Because reactions can be synthesized, processes can be synthesized. What happens in millisecond, uh, what happens in seconds can be done in milliseconds. What happens in years can be done in minutes. Because of course, chemists, we don't have a patients to wait for years to, for a reaction to take place. So that is useless, right? So I think I will not go through this. What I'm trying to say that as a, as a people you are growing up, we must move from puzzle to problem. I hope you understand. Sorry, this is wrong. This is TWO, two, TWO. So these are some of the puzzles. I, I don't know if you have solved these puzzles. Yes, you know, you know the answer to the puzzles? OK. Second one? Yeah, second one is easy. Yeah. Second one, you have 7 liter and 5 liter bucket, buckets. Using only these two bottles, count out 12. You have no other measuring objects. So just put 7 liter and 5 liter, that's 12. If you have 7 and pour it to a 5 liter bucket, what remains is 2. right? So the arithmetic of 7 and 5, you can actually generate 1 to 12. And if you know this problem, I am happy. What is the, what is the answer? Um, so if the last one is a bomb, then it's one. But if the last one is a bomb, Okay. But it's infinity. Yeah, it's actually not infinity. So, so how, how, how do you divide? So how do you divide? Is it not half? Well, average of 0 and 1. So I don't know how much of maths you have learned. If I give you s equal to this up to infinity, I write s equal to this by shifting. So plus 1 comes here. Then I sum. Then 2s will be, everything will cancel, right? Plus and minus, but 1 will remain. So 2s equal to 1. So s is half. Tell that to a mathematician. What is his reaction? You, you understand the question? I write s equal to 1 plus 1. And then I write s equal to this by shifting. 1, that's the very standard thing that we do. Sum them, then 2s is equal to 1, up to infinity. Everything cancels, so s is half. But you can now keep asking, oh, no, no, I'll shift it by 2. So again, plus 1 comes there, minus 1. Then again, it will become 0. Think of the solution. But what I'm trying to say, this may be IIT JE problem, OK, puzzle problem. We are very good in solving this. I grant that you will be eventually solve this. All of you take interest in maths because you want to go to JE, you will solve it. You will be able to solve this. You will be able to solve many such puzzles. These are called puzzles. But what we require is not puzzles. We require you to solve problems. I, I distinguish between puzzle and problems. I talked of renewable energy, chemistry. That's a problem. How do you get energy efficient building is a problem. How do you get healthcare is a problem. And that is where India is very, very weak. You are growing up, I'm telling you, we are good in solving puzzles. Our students become first, second in Olympiad. You have heard. When it comes to solution, we don't have any solutions. So the problems. So I tell you an example of a building. I'm not talking of energy efficient. Let's say this building has a crack. Now what do you do? Somebody from Ashoka team, will come and find the crack and report to the engineer. Engineer will find a solution. However, this crack, you know, today you have a GPS. So the engineer can see this crack from home or computer. You don't need to report. That's a technology which is available. But even more interesting is that when this crack has come here, something will automatically come and fill that gap. Do you think it is possible? It is possible. That means it actuates by itself. It senses and actuates. There is a journal called sensors and actuators. That's an amazing technology. So what will happen is that as soon as there is a gap, there is a sensing mechanism. And somewhere there is a cement, our resources there, they will be driven to that point. It is an interesting combination of engineering, chemistry, 
physics, and, and there we are very, very weak. Because I am a physicist, I don't like chemistry, right? Sorry. Just one minute. Hello? Ha, ah, Rangan, yeah, tell me. Yeah, yeah, tell me. Yeah, I understand. I'm Jaydeep Sylvia. Ah, so can So, yeah, doesn't matter. I only said I'm in a class. <laughs> so the point is, what I'm trying to say is that uh, we need solutions. So I was telling you that this problem, this is, an act, this is called sensors and actuators. So it can sense and bring the molecule there. That will be wonderful because you don't need any engineer to come. Have we thought of it? How to do it? It will require combination of chemists, engineer to talk to each other and we don't talk to each other, unfortunately. And that is our problem. And we take pride in saying that I am this and I am not that. So why should I do it? You come to me with chemistry problem, I am not a chemist. Nothing will happen. So you have to talk to each other and that is very, very important. So what we need is a solution. Solar to electricity, you all talked of solar to electricity. You need materials which will convert. Again, it is not a chemistry problem alone. It has engineering, it has physics, it has chemistry. And it is not having a solution. It has to have a solution which will be cheaper than the, I told you about that. Otherwise, I don't care about any solution. If you do a hydrogen powered car, which is very expensive, that's not a solution. It has to be cheaper than the conventional thing. So that is a very, very important thing. Wind energy, fuel cell, hydrogen, bio waste, clean coal. Clean coal is also very important. That is carbon dioxide. That means you use coal, but it is clean. How do you do that? Put the carbon dioxide, convert it to methanol, formic acid, whatever you want to do. So put a factory, methanol factory, right in the place of the coal, coal burning. Wherever your coal is burning, the carbon dioxide doesn't go in the air, it just goes. I have seen this in Mannheim in Germany, believe me. They have already done it 10, 15 years back. We have not been able to do it. It requires government regulations that all carbon dioxide factories must come with the coal together. So CO2 will never go in. It, these are very, very simple things, but it requires governmental agencies, different scientists all to come together. Political science, politicians, everybody has to come together to many solutions. Solutions are not only by scientists. And this is where we are missing the bus. Politicians think, oh, you are scientists, you solve. We have no role. But they have a role because they are regulatory body. Somebody has to tell that this is what you have to do. And this is, this is the very, very important part that I'm telling. At the end, whatever you do, chemistry, whatever you do, please find a solution. Society needs a solution. Okay? I, I leave you with some of the grand challenges. Some of the grand challenges, I don't care whether it is chemistry or physics or engineering. But some of the grand challenges which will make the world better. And I have said nitrogen cycle, carbon, hydrogen storage, chemistry for environment. More or less I have covered climate change, healthcare, renewable energy, clean energy, environment. So if you can solve, these are some of the grand challenge problems that we have. And unfortunately, we are missing the bus. Today, the government is talking about it. Make this problem, any of these, any one of these. So if you can solve any one of these, the society will be very happy. But unfortunately, we are not. So we, we become cocoon in our own world. So as you are growing up, please remember this. It is already happening. Many of the problems, people are having solutions. So then we buy from China or Europe the technology. We don't have a technology. That's very unfortunate. All right, so I think I will...
and live with these materials. And so the big picture is very important. And because there are so many things, I can just quick, quickly. So these are the fuel cells. This is artificial photosynthesis, solar powered window. I talked about it, and so on. LEDs. These amazing things that are happening here. I have only drug design is another very important thing. I talked about healthcare. It requires a lot of things. Unfortunately, it requires chemistry. You talk of biocatalysis, that's also chemistry. There is catalysis. So I think it's very interesting. I have lots of slides, which I will now close. And I will leave it with this. This is the, yeah, I will have interaction. This is the slide, because I, I am working on computational chemistry. So I want to tell you that computational chemistry can be used in drug design. I am a pseudo chemist, because I am a computational chemist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can. People are doing that actually. In fact, we are giving a course on computational drug discovery from last year, last semester. We are here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. He's also around. Yeah. They are also around. Okay. So no problem. Just, but before that, I want to give oh, okay. this Thank small you. thing. Thank to you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So, oh, they feel you're genius. Yeah. Thank <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Marcus. It's actually a yeah, book Marcus. So good. Genius. So, question. Yeah. Questions. Name and then discuss. Sir, my question is why does the octet law exist? Why? Yes. Well, that's very interesting. Just one minute. So, for example, materials, uh, atoms like carbon. What is its valency? It's 4, right? What are the orbitals that it have? 1s, 2s, 2p. Right? So balance starts from 2s. Core is not participating in chemical bond. So if all of it is filled, how many electrons will be there? 8, 2s2, 2p6. So if you have 8 electrons, apart from the K, because then the cell is complete. S and P are complete, right? No other electron can come because I told you every electron orbital can have only two electrons. There's a Pauli principle. That's a fundamental quantum mechanics. You cannot have an orbital more than two electrons because you have only two spins. So something has to be unique. So if you have 2s and 2p, you have eight. So the octet rule was found in the context of the first row of the periodic table. If you try with iron, manganese, or lead, transition metal, it is not correct anyway. Okay, so that was the reason. Because you have only four orbitals, P has three orbitals, S has one orbital, four into two is eight. So then it becomes completely filled. So if it is completely filled, it will not react. You are happy. You are completely satisfied, right? Yes. Huh? Yeah, so you're not like inert gas. Like neon, argon, right? Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Shreya from Mumbai, sir. Why is that there are some acceptations in metal like potassium and sodium are softer and mercury is a liquid at room temperature? Mercury is liquid at temperature? Room temperature. Okay. Room. So now, what is a solid? I did not discuss solid liquid gas. Solid liquid gas are defined by intermolecular interactions, right? So as you heat up any material, what will happen? Interactions will increase or decrease if you heat. They will break. So they will become more liquid or gas. So now depending on the initial interactions, the mercury itself at the room temperature has such an interaction that it is liquid. If you heat up further, it will become gas, much, much further. So not at room temperature. So that is called boiling point. And solid to liquid is called melting point. So boiling, melting point, boiling points are actually described by intermolecular interactions. Okay, so those are more quantitative talk. So mercury is very special. All, all atoms are not like that. Any more question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, hello. 
Mm. Uh, so there was some research recently about the new catalyst for the Haber process. Was zinc one of them, like, in one, uh, for that? So, yeah, there are a lot of research going for nitrogen to ammonia. What are you asking for the Haber process substitute? So many research. Literature is full of it. Okay. But none has come to a stage where it can be adopted by industry. So what is being used now? Like Still the same iron catalyst, iron and nickel. Yeah, and I had another question. Which is the Haber boss catalyst. No, another question about huh? photovoltaic cells. Photovoltaic cells yeah, is how different. Do they, how do they? Yeah, it's totally different. Huh. It's a different question. So, like, how do they work? Could you like summarize? Because the sun comes, yeah, yeah. then there is a material like this, yeah. iron or whatever. Now they are using perovskites, I think. That material converts it to electricity. Could you like elaborate on that? So conductivity with the sunlight. So yeah, it's again. Yeah, it's all different. So materials which are. Yeah, they have different properties. So one of them which is doing very well is perovskites now. Sure. Or the perovskites. These are ABO3 materials. So A and B are two metals and then three oxygen atoms. So they are doing very well. So there are a lot of, lot of materials. So this is where chemistry research is full of synthesis, application. And that is hardcore chemistry you have to do, right? Yeah, so photovoltaics is again chemistry. And, but photovoltaics, is something that a lot of studies have already been done. Okay, so it is close to being a technology in the market. You might have seen photovoltaics in the market now because already research has happened. But Haber process is still not in that stage where I can replace the Haber-Boss catalyst. 